Uh, good morning again. Uh, if you were not here for the first session, um, one, you missed a very important and, and informative uh, panel uh, on gender and gun violence in Louisiana with some lively discussion in the aftermath of that uh, panel. Um, now we're ready to move into the second panel. Um, before we do that, just a quick announcement. Um, after this, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, if you're interested, there are some sheets on the uh, chairs that list local lunch spots. Uh, we will have some food available here. Um, as, as you know, we, we've got a, a limited number of people we can feed, but I think right now our numbers are pretty good, so we might be able to, to feed everyone uh, here, and, and, and I'm happy to, to do that for you if, we, if we're able to do that. Um, the other thing is, of course, uh, throughout the day, uh, John Ritchie will be screening his films, Shell Shocked, and then later 91% uh, this afternoon. Um, if you haven't seen those or heard about them, you're welcome to talk with John. He's over across the way in the main house, um, and you can, uh, you can come and go as you please uh, in the screening room. Uh, the uh, panel uh, that we're about to begin is one that uh, came together quite nicely, I think. We first uh, came upon this idea of doing this symposium on, on gun violence uh, in the aftermath of, of late July's shootings here in Lafayette. Uh, and I immediately reached out to a number of other institutions in the state to see if there were people at those places that wanted to participate. And so uh, we're happy that uh, uh, we got a, a, a nice uh, handful of people from elsewhere, uh, including our panelists today, Jeff Dancy from Tulane University. Um, but this uh, topic, uh, or these topics that are going to be discussed, I think are uh, uh, quite significant and quite important as we try to come to terms with what's going on in Louisiana and confront the problem with gun violence. So I'm going to turn the panel over to our moderator, Chase Edwards, who is uh, from right here in our backyard, UL Lafayette, uh, and allow him to uh, kind of oversee the panel uh, and, uh, and get things underway. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Uh, again, my name is Chase Edwards. I teach now in the business school here at UL. Um, and my research interests include the ban the box movement, which is the effort to uh, encourage employers not to ask about previous convictions uh, to, in order to allow folks to uh, re-enter the workforce and the economy, and uh, sentencing reform when it comes to uh, some of the topics that we're talking about here today. We're going to um, start off with Professor Amy Brown, but I'd like to introduce Professor Jeff Darcy. He's a Dancy, I'm sorry, I'm it's sorry. Okay. Uh, uh, an assistant professor uh, of political science at Tulane University, and he's going to talk about the need for regulation and balancing regulation with our rights uh, right after Professor uh, Amy Brown, who's going to start us off. Uh, she's an associate professor of psychology here uh, who is going to talk about the psychological effects of being exposed to guns and gun violence. So take it away. All right, thank you. Thanks to everybody for uh, deciding to not enjoy the film screening to come here and listen to some more talks. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna be talking, um, uh, well I guess uh, to outline my talk, I'm gonna be talking, um, reviewing research, uh, largely psychological, but um, drawing from some other fields as well, uh, to talk about three different areas, the effects of exposure to guns, the effects of exposure to gun violence and violence in general, and the effects of access to guns, and then try and tie all of this stuff together at the end of the talk. <clears throat> so, uh, <coughs> excuse me, uh, at the effects of exposure to guns and other weapons uh, was largely spearheaded by a rather classic study um, in the 1960s by Berkowitz and LePage, um, where they introduced the concept of the weapons effect. Uh, so basically, um, uh, the idea is that uh, exposure to guns, just mere exposure, um, has been shown to increase hostility and aggressive behavior. Uh, uh, and um, so basically, the Berkowitz and LePage study um, is kind of an interesting setup. They had uh, male college students come into a lab, and um, they were angered by having them, um, they received electrical shocks from a supposed partner who was, and the shocks were supposedly a negative evaluation of a project that they had worked on. Um, and then they were given the opportunity to um, deliver electric shocks as an evaluation of their partner. And so they were brought into another room where they could deliver, you know, the, the evaluative shocks. And in that room, left on a table, there were either weapons, um, so it was, I think, uh, um, 
a shotgun and a handgun, I believe. I don't remember the exact ones, but they were, they were firearms uh, left on a table, um, or there was nothing on the table, or there was a badminton racket and shuttlecocks. Uh, and when they were when they were in this room with just guns, you know, in eyesight, people delivered more shocks to their partners than when there was nothing or when there was a badminton racket on the table. Uh, this um, uh, other studies followed up throughout the mostly in the 1970s. Uh, many of them confirmed this effect, and it's also been demonstrated in a natural environment. So Turner and colleagues uh, did a study where they. Um, had a vehicle stop at a stoplight and then not go whenever the light turned green. And they measured uh, how many people honked their horns in response to this, you know, social uh, uh, faux pas, I guess, and found that people were more, more prompt to honk their horns when there was a gun rack and rifle visible in the back of the vehicle than when there was not. Uh, <laughs> And then um, other studies have shown that simply um, seeing pictures of guns uh, has increased um, aggressive response and responding in aggressive uh, uh, cognitions. Uh, now, the weapons effect has not always been demonstrated, and there was a, a great deal of sort of hot debate uh, within the psychological community um, in the 1970s and 80s um, about the existence of this effect. Um, but the accumulation of research does tend to suggest that it is a true effect, and um, a meta-analysis by Carlson, Carlson and colleagues uh, indicates, so, so summarizes, you know, all of the studies that have been done um, on si sort of situational cues and, uh, and aggression, and found that the effect, the effect is a real effect, um, but it does seem to be stronger amongst people who are in a negative mood, for instance, having been angered, um, and it is only limited to participants who are not suspicious of the sort of experimental hypothesis and participants who are not evaluative of be or apprehensive of being evaluated. Uh, so in an experimental context, you know, this is the kind of people that we want. We want people who are, you know, treating it as a natural situation rather than like, what are you going to think about me? Uh, so that does suggest that, you know, amongst people who are treating it as a natural situation, um, they do seem to be effect affected by the presence of weapons. Um, and explanations for this effect suggest that it's due to a cognitive Me cognitive priming mechanism that basically um, visual exposure to weapons uh, sort of activates schemas that are associated with other sort of you know hostility and violence so that basically we sort of have cognitive structures that help us organize the world and guns are part of that sort of violence and hostility construct. So the weapons effect concerns only mere exposure to weapons, usually taken out of any violence-related context. Uh, if aggression is increased under such circumstances, then it makes sense that aggression would be similarly, if not more, affected by exposure to guns in a violent context and to other acts of interpersonal violence. Um, and indeed, it does seem that there, um, so I guess one, re one re area of research that is particularly relevant to exposure to weapons in a more um, kind of violence-related context is the exposure to violent media, including uh, video games, uh, television and film violence, and even um, violence in the music industry. And uh, there's a you know, long history of studies that do, send, that do indicate that there's an association between exposure to violent media and aggression. Uh, and this has been demonstrated in both correlational and experimental studies, meaning that it's not simply a matter of aggressive people being drawn to more violent media, that experimental studies have demonstrated that exposure to violent media can increase aggressive related thoughts and behaviors. Um, these effects have been demonstrated amongst children, adolescents, and adults. Uh, and has been found, you know, in a number of contexts. Um, more recently, uh, research has tended to focus more on violent video games um, because that's become such an important part of our society. Uh, and um, uh, sorry. And so, yeah. So um, there's, you know, there's still debate. There's still people, you know, arguing on both sides of this issue whether vi playing violent video games does or does not promote aggressive behavior. Um, but it does seem to be that at least in some people, playing violent video games does promote aggression. Uh, although the interesting flip side of the coin is that, well, I, actually. Studies have shown not only does playing violent video games can it increase aggressive behavior, it actually can decrease pro-social behavior as well. Uh, and um, part of this reason, part of this is that the mediators of this sort of um, uh, violence exposure and aggression effect seem to be things like uh, 
uh, impulsivity, attentional deficits, and empathic concern. So a long history of being exposed to violent media, for instance, playing violent video games, um, has been associated with uh, increase, in, increases in impulsivity, uh, problems with um, sort of attentional processes, and lowering of empathic concern. Uh, so, and one can imagine that after, you know, um, years of having these sort of cognitive and emotional factors impacted, then this would make it easier for one to respond aggressively or make it harder for them to uh, uh, control a, a, a sort of a desire to engage aggressively. Um, so yeah, so exposure to violent video games not only increases aggression, but it actually decreases pro-social behavior. Uh, so it not only makes us kind of meaner, it can make us less nice. Um, the flip side of that is that research has also shown that playing pro-social video games can decrease aggression and increase uh, helpful behavior. Uh, so that's, you know, something to look forward to. Unfortunately, violent video games are much more popular than pro-social video games. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so there's um, sort of uh, uh, cognitive and emotional mediators of the relationship between exposure to violent media and aggression, um, there, but there also are some important moderators. Uh, this, that, that, you know, we all know that not everybody who plays violent video games acts, ag behaves aggressively, and research does suggest that, um, that this effect may be moderated or may differ based on trait levels of aggression. So people who are sort of more naturally inclined to be, be, behave aggressively are even more strongly impacted by exposure to violent media than people who are less inclined to behave aggressively. Um, there's also situational moderators, uh, a recent study uh, by um, McGloin and colleagues from earlier this summer showed that increased realism and immersion in violent video games um, dramatically increases uh, the activation of aggressive cognition. So they had people play a, uh, a first-person shooter game, and um, they played it either using a sort of traditional game, uh, you know, game controller device, or they had them play it using a uh, motion capture realistic gun. Uh, to control their actions in the game, and they found that aggressive cognitions were considerably higher amongst the people who played with a realistic game controller than people who played with the sort of more traditional, uh, you know, joystick type game controller. So some of the theoretical explanations uh, for these effects are, well, I guess, um, the, weapon, the, the traditional weapons effect was first explained uh, by evoking sort of classical con conditioning um, or effective mechanisms. However, uh, as research accumulated, it seems to be largely due to a cognitive mechanism. However, the effects of exposure to, violent, to, to media violence seem more complex, um, with good evidence that they're both cognitive, affective, learning, and even neurological mechanisms play a role uh, in this process. And, uh, and Albert Bandura's uh, social learning or social cognitive theory seems to be particularly ap applicable. Uh, so in um, uh, Bandura's early experience, experiments, uh, he showed that, aggress that violent behavior or aggressive behavior could be learned by exposing young children to uh, an aggressive model. So they, they exposed them to an adult who was playing with this blow-up toy called a Bobo doll, um, and they showed the adult you know, beating up the doll, sitting on it, you know, punching it, and then they put the children in a room, and they found that children were more likely to behave violently towards the Bobo doll when they'd been exposed to a model doing so, and that this, this was even more likely to occur when um, the model was the same sex as the child, and if they'd seen the model being reinforced for engaging in this behavior. So to sort of simplify and summarize Bandura's theory, he suggests that we can learn through observation, but this is enhanced by the expectation of reinforcement for the behavior, um, and, but this is also modified by intentional processes, goals, and self-regulatory abilities. So Bandura's theory um, is uh, applicable to exposure to media violence, but it's also very applicable to exposure to real-world violence, um, the kind of violence that you know, we may experience in our communities or in our homes. Um, and a number of studies have shown that there is a, um, that, that that one of the strongest predictors in adolescence of violent behavior, both actual violent behavior and hypothetical violent behavior, is a history of exposure to violence in the community, um, amongst peers, and in the and in the home. Uh, and um, although most of the uh, most of the research in this. Um, domain has looked at sort of more um, children from impoverished backgrounds in inner city environments. Uh, it's been demonstrated amongst rural youth as well. So Slovak and Singer um, measured exposure to gun violence in particular and found in a, in a rural setting and found that those adolescents who had greater exposure to gun violence had a greater history of violent behavior. Um, 
Furthermore, uh, exposure to violence within the community is associated not only with aggressive behavior, but also with mental health problems, including PTSD, depression, and substance use. Um, and I won't get into a lot of that research, but there is evidence that, um, that at least certain uh, mental health problems, including substance use and PTSD, have been associated with violent behavior as well. All right, so just to summarize up to this point, the weapons effect shows that exposure to guns can increase aggressive cognitions and aggressive behavior um, when an acceptable target for aggression is, near, is, is provided. But these studies do not suggest that any exposure to weapons will elicit violent behavior. I mean, we're all exposed to probably images of weapons on a regular basis and we don't go around hurting other people. Um, however, if we add in um, regular exposure to violent content in the media or in our environments, then that further increases the likelihood of behaving in an aggressive manner. Um, and then let's add in the factor of owning a gun, which provides not only exposure to weapons um, and the subsequent cognitive priming of aggression, it provides an available tool to use to commit violence if these impulses are activated. So, in, so, several, so a few studies have shown that owning a weapon is associated with an increased likelihood of responding to threats in an aggressive manner. Uh, so Friday and colleagues uh, surveyed adults in communities in the US and Japan and found that owning a weapon, um, they asked people about their weapons ownership and they gave them hypothetical scenarios and asked them how likely they would be to choose different responses, um, some of those responses being sort of a violent uh, or aggressive responses. And they found that although Americans were more likely to report owning weapons and were more likely to choose aggressive responses than their Japanese counterparts, um, they did find that uh, in both countries, weapons ownership was associated with higher likelihood of choosing the aggressive response in the hypothetical scenario. Uh, another study by Hemingway and colleagues uh, used data from a national survey of U.S. drivers and asked about experiences with making obscene gestures towards other drivers on the road and about things like aggressively following other cars. And they found that both behaviors were more prevalent amongst those who admitted to having a gun in the vehicle. Now, both of these studies are correlational, so they don't indicate that having a gun in one's possession necessarily makes you more, more, makes you more aggressive. It could be that people who are naturally more aggressive are more likely to own weapons and have them nearby. Um, however, as we've already reviewed, experimental evidence of the weapons effect does show that you know, mere exposure to guns and other weapons can increase aggressive responding. So uh, when we're talking about uh, the impact of access to guns, perhaps most obviously, uh, the sort of the most extreme type of aggressive behavior um, would be using a weapon to end the life of oneself or someone else. Um, and indeed, studies um, at both the um, individual level and population level studies have shown that gun ownership is associated with increased homicide and suicide rates. Um, now, uh, there is, especially when looking at homicide rates, uh, um, it differs sort of the, the level at which the analysis conducted. Um, the, this relationship is smaller um, and much more modest um, of the relationship between um, gun ownership and homicide victimization when looked at at the individual level. But an obvious explanation for this is that people who are victims of, of firearm related homicides are generally not killed with their own guns. Uh, whereas um, there's a stronger association at, in, at the individual level of gun ownership and suicide rates because most people who um, commit suicide using a firearm do indeed use their own guns. Um, however, if we look at, um, sorry, if we look at, uh, well, never mind, uh, if we look at population-based studies, so studies that have looked at, you know, um, large-scale gun ownership or availability of guns based on gun ownership um, and homicide and suicide rates, there is, a clear, there is an association of gun ownership, prevalence of guns and um, both homicide and suicide. Uh, so because again, because the fo focus of my study was more on mental health, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about that relationship between gun ownership or uh, access to guns and suicide in particular. Um, so I was recently, um, uh, read two studies by Anestis and colleagues that came out earlier this year on um, uh, and looked at state level laws um, for that regulate gun ownership and suicide rates. Uh, and he and his colleagues examined state laws that were associated with things like requiring permits to own handguns, um, requiring a waiting period, et cetera, um, and found that basically when and compared states that had 
any of these, you know, they looked at each law separately and compared the states that, you know, had restrictions according to this law versus those that did not restrict gun ownership according to each of these things um, and found and looked at state level rates of overall suicides, firearm suicides, and the percentage of suicides committed by firearms um, and found that for each of these comparisons, uh, even when controlling for demographic statistics such as poverty level, education level, um, and things like that, uh, in almost every case, uh, there is a significant relationship between um, regulation of access to guns and um, overall suicides, firearm suicides, and percentage of suicides attributable to firearms. Um, and what that indicates is that people who want to kill themselves um, are not just finding other means to do it, that firearms are, are potentially lethal um, mode of, su of conducting suicide, and they're also being highly available so many times suicide, many times suicide is planned, but many times it's an impulsive act. Um, and that sort of desire may dissipate if one does not have access to a gun in one's environment. Um, so, uh, so this, so basically to, to try and um, um, wrap things up and, so, and put together a lot of these factors that I've talked about, um, I tried to, you know, create a kind of graphic, putting everything together, I realize it's a little complicated, um, but it seems to kind of start with access to guns, um, that access to gu guns um, increases our exposure to guns in our environment. Um, exposure to guns increases aggressive, um, has been shown to increase aggressive thoughts um, and aggressive behaviors. Um, this sort of, these aggression constructs are also impacted by exposure to violence in one's environment. Um, exposure to vi violence increases not only aggression, but also psychological distress. Um, aggress aggressive thoughts thoughts and feelings when coupled with um, psychological distress or other mental health concerns um, increase the likelihood of actually behaving in a violent manner, including things like homicide and suicide, uh, which is exacerbated by access to guns and of course, you know, starts the cycle all over again. Um, so it seems like to break this cycle, we need to intervene at some point. Um, and it seems like a, you know, potentially logical step place to intervene would be at restricting that access to guns. Um, however, you know, this is not always, you know, this isn't the simple like, oh, let's get rid of guns. You know, we all know that that's not a simple, uh, you know, matter. Um, so uh, I think uh, Dr. Dancy will probably touch a little bit on the sort of complexities of our right to bear arms and what that means for restricting access to guns. Uh, so thank you very much. Hi everyone, I'm Jeff Dancy from Tulane University Department of Political Science uh, and I just want to say thanks for having me here. Uh, I jumped at the chance to come speak to you about gun violence in the United States but also gun rights which is something that hasn't really come up today uh, thus far. Uh, if I could just start this presentation mode. I should say also that I'm not used to speaking on a mic. The last time I spoke on a mic was when I ritually failed at stand-up comedy in college. Um, so it brings back bad memories but I'll do my best. Um, I've been invited to speak about guns from the perspective of human rights law and policy. Uh, human rights, uh, briefly defined, are the privileges, claims, and immunities that we have regardless of where we live or what country we belong to. They were first defined in, or defined in 1948 by a group of experts from countries all over the world, and they've since been introduced uh, through 17 total treaties that uh, are brought about by the United Nations. They're multilateral treaties that many countries sign and ratify. The US isn't typically one of those countries. We've only ratified a few of these human rights treaties. One is the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Another is the Convention Against Torture. Uh, but typically, our courts don't apply the rules of international human rights law to domestic law. In the US, the Constitution reigns supreme. So, the task for me is, as a human rights expert, what could I possibly add to a conversation on gun rights and gun policy in the United States where human rights doesn't typically apply? Um, well, that's uh, part of my trick, is trying to explain to you how I would go about telling my mom and dad who are in the crowd and members of my family and people from Shreveport, Louisiana, where I'm from, how human rights makes a difference to this debate, and also how we need to think about this in a larger rights context. 
So I outline pragmatic steps that we might take to actually address politically the problem of gun violence, which I'm taking as a given. It's a given problem. Uh, Professor Brown has introduced us to that, and also the first panel did an excellent job of explaining how this is a, specifically a problem in Louisiana, but also a national problem. But I want to take that problem and I want to think about it pragmatically. Uh, this is what I work on. Uh, my first book project is Pragmatism and Human Rights. So the first thing that you do is you identify with the other side. Whatever side you're on, identify with the other side in the debate and try to figure out what's moving them and what's explaining their interest in the issue. The second thing to do is embrace that in the United States we have an unfettered right to own a handgun. Uh, we have an unfettered right to bear arms. And then we need to put that right in worldwide context. So that's the second thing that you do. The third thing that you do is explain that regulations can and must coexist with rights if rights are to be meaningful in society. They always coexist with rights. That's something that human rights experts are really familiar with. Fourth, you have to explain that our current laws on guns or lack of laws are actually making us less free in the United States and making us an indecent society. So those are the four things I'm gonna to try to do to you today. I thought that originally with my students who, uh, my students and I have been working on this for three weeks, uh, getting together evidence. I have like 100 pages of evidence if uh, anybody wants to ask any questions, probably overkill. Uh, but um, what I thought I was gonna to have to do is maybe convince a bunch of people from the local community that this, this should matter to them. But I think that I'm talking to the like-minded, so instead I'm gonna explain how I was gonna go about doing that, which is following those four steps. So first, let me just say that human rights experts normally don't think much about guns unless they're conceptual, conceptualizing threats to human rights. Uh, the first reason is that, technically speaking, the right to bear arms is decidedly not a recognized human right in the international community. There is no human right to bear arms, and it doesn't make sense to have one. Uh, the second reason is that in developing countries, small arms are wielded by abusive police forces, warlords, and terrorist groups. Uh, to kill and torment local populations. This is something that we know about so small arms and that's why we try to limit them. The task for many human rights activists is actually to stop gun runners from selling arms to bad guys. Um, as a result, most human rights activists actually hate guns um, and one of the most popular policies that they promote in countries riddled with civil war is called disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration, which promises to forgive rebel organizations for their crimes against the government for fighting civil wars if they agree to destroy their guns. Uh, this is a picture of two African diplomats uh, actually lighting pyres of guns on fire uh, in a, a local African context. Uh, DDR is a positive innovation made by human rights activists that helps countless states like El Salvador or Liberia end bloody civil wars. Uh, this is the way that I think about rights now because I'm a human rights, or sorry, that I think about guns now because I'm a human rights expert. But I need to realize that this is not the way that people in the United States think about guns. Okay? Uh, we in the United States haven't had to worry about civil war in roughly 150 years. And most of the 40% of U.S. households that own guns are law-abiding, peaceful households that aren't fighting wars and aren't committing crimes. For most of us, then, guns are not a visible source of human misery. That's just the way that most people with guns approach the issue in the United States. I'm different from most human rights experts because I'm from Shreveport, Louisiana, and the truth is that I'm actually impressed by the power of gun, guns and I like shooting them. Uh, I also received my first gun from this lovely woman, my grandmother, Louise Dancy, uh, who gave me a pump action 22 rifle that was made in 1929 and used to be used in fairs to, to shoot at targets. Um, and my dad also had a gun rack on his truck, though I think it was just to appear macho. Uh, you need to speak to the women that were presenting in the first panel about uh, masculinity. Um, but I also owned a gun when I looked like this and I lived in college. I was at the University of North Texas in Denton and I owned a snub-nosed 38 revolver that I kept uh, primarily for the purpose of self-defense in my home. I never needed this gun, I was never victimized by a crime, and I've never ever been victimized by a crime, or at least a violent crime. I've had my car stolen in New Orleans, but that's pretty much par for the course. Um, uh, but it's important to think about this. I had a gun when I was 
the least in danger of ever experiencing gun or violent crime. And this is the experience for most people in the United States. Most people who are pro-guns are worried about home invasions, but they also have the benefit of rarely having ever been victimized by crime. This is an interesting thing to keep into account. Um, most people who are in poor and minority communities that live in hyper-violent sections of cities like Central City in New Orleans uh, or South Chicago, both places where I've li I haven't lived in those parts of those cities, but I've lived in the, both of those cities, these people despise guns because so many of their family members have been shot to death by guns. Okay, so we have a disconnect between people that are largely law-abiding gun owners in their homes that keep them for self-defense and people that have to have guns on the street because they're actively worried about being shot every day. This disconnect has actually widened. Uh, so some of, these are some of the victims of gun violence that I see every day in New Orleans on TV uh, that include both police officers and young children. Uh, and this is a fairly regular occurrence. Um, and this is something that I don't think that everybody that lives in rural areas in Louisiana is necessarily accustomed to. Uh, but also, uh, we need to recognize that our disconnect spreads throughout the United States. So in Washington, D.C., this is a, a school bus that was uh, shot up by guns. I don't think anybody was actually harmed in this, but it's a striking visual element to consider this problem. But in Washington, D.C., local law enforcement officers are tired of people calling 911 uh, because of shootouts in their neighborhoods. Um, so in the 1970s, they passed a number of restrictions that they've tried to continue to enforce over time. Of course, none of those restrictions worked because all of the criminals just go to Virginia and buy their guns there or Maryland and buy their guns there and come back into uh, the District of Columbia. So there's not a national system of reg uh, regulations, so you can just circumvent any given city's regulations if you need to. Uh, but this is also an important uh, place because this, uh, the, Washington, D.C. is where uh, our constitutional right to bear arms as an individual right was established in 2008 in a case called D.C. versus Heller. It pitted Dick Heller versus those regulations in Washington, D.C. Dick Heller was a guy who lived across from a, uh, an old abandoned house that was routinely shot up by gangs. Uh, and one time he found a bullet hole actually in his front door. Uh, and this is a man who also guarded a federal building with a handgun. So he was carrying a handgun for his daily job, but because of DC's restrictions, he couldn't actually have a handgun in his home that was on the ready. Uh, so based on this, uh, some, some people brought a case uh, that eventually found its way to the Supreme Court, and that Supreme Court decision, D.C. versus Heller, uh, established incontrovertibly that each individual in the United States has the right to have a gun. And recently, an appeals court in D.C. extended the ruling to say uh, that a law limiting gun purchases to one gun purchase per month, called the one gun a month law, is unconstitutional. So based on D.C. Heller, we're starting to outlaw some restrictions in the world, or sorry, in the United States. Um, the second part of what I was going to explain, though, is that we need to take this right and put it in worldwide context and explain to people that assert their right what this right looks like in the world. So right now, because of D.C. Heller, the constitutional right is now unquestioned, um, but in global perspective, it's also very unique. So in the 1850s, roughly 15% of all countries had a right to bear arms. Now it's only four countries. These four countries are the United States, Mexico, Haiti, Guatemala. All of these states not incidentally have a tremendous amount of gun violence. Okay? Um, our, right, our right to bear arms in the, uh, in the U.S is also not accompanied by legal provisions that limit that right, even though in all of those other states it is. For example, in Haiti, you can have a gun in your home, but you can't have a gun in public. Um, and that's built into the constitutional uh, perspective. So recent litigation is actually moving us to a situation where people can have guns anywhere, and the only limitation in some states are on people with previous mental illness, previous criminal records, or a record of domestic violence. That means that all citizens in the United States basically can have a gun as long as they're not verifiably mentally ill or criminal. And it also means that these laws wouldn't stop first-time offenders like the Columbine shooters, the Vir Virginia Tech shooter, the theater shooter in Colorado, most members of the KKK that still have guns, most neo-Nazis, or most members of the Black Panthers from bearing arms. We can't stop any of those people because most of them are law-abiding. Under our laws, they would have an absolute right to own a gun. Be that as it may, 
Our Second Amendment right is now guaranteed, and this is something that we must reckon with. We have an individual right to have a gun. Between 1939 and 2008, or sorry, yeah, 1939 and 2008, most courts didn't interpret the Second Amendment as bestowing an individual right. Uh, but now we have the new ruling protecting this right. Uh, and so opponents of gun rights argue that this uh, kind of follows an old pattern, that the rest of the world uh, outlaws something that's hyper-violent and the United States follows 40 or 50 years later outlawing it. But in the meantime, we basically still have uh, a hyper-violent society. So for example, the rest of the world outlawed slavery 40 years before the US did. The rest of the world has also basically outlawed the death penalty. If you look at this, these are all the countries that have outlawed the death penalty. It's over, uh, it's, it, it's getting close to um, eight, I, so 60%, what does that say? I'm actually, uh, it's, it's a basically 120 countries in the world. I'm not sure what the axes are, it doesn't matter. 160, or 120 countries in the world have completely abolished the death penalty. And many states in the, in the United States have also abolished the death penalty. But in the, we're, we're behind as a country for not doing it and we're behind in the South because most Southern states keep the death penalty alive. Um, so still, from a political perspective, D.C. versus Heller is good because it settles what used to be the main argument between pro-gun and anti-gun activists, which is whether there's a right. Okay? Now, we absolutely have that right, and this is precisely the reason that the National Rifle Association opposed bringing the case to the Supreme Court. Why? Because they don't get to scaremonger anymore. They don't get to say that the government is going to come take your guns because the government literally now cannot come take your guns. It's constitutionally prohibited. So one NRA lobbyist said, nothing keeps the fundraising machine worrying more than convincing the faithful that they're a pro-gun David facing an invincible anti-gun Goliath. Right? This is no longer an option on the table for, for uh, pro-gun activists. They're no longer in danger of having their guns taken by the government because it's constitutionally prohibited. So the first lesson is when speaking to pro-gun people, if you're anti-guns, you need to say that you can no longer claim that. You can no longer claim that the government's coming to take your guns. Uh, the second thing you need to say is that uh, we don't need to be scared of regulations. In fact, all rights exist with regulations. Uh, and let me prove it to you. So first, in DC versus Heller itself, which was written by Judge Antonin Scalia, the judgment, it says, nothing in our opinion should be taken to cast doubt on long-standing prohibitions on the possession of firearms by felons and the mentally ill, or laws forbidding the carrying of firearms in sensitive places such as schools and government buildings, or laws imposing conditions and qualifications on the commercial sale of arms. We can, according to the very case that gave us the right to bear arms, incontrovertibly, we can still have regulations on that right to bear arms. They can coexist. What a surprise. Okay. Um, still, the mere mention of regulation will mean that gun enthusiasts will start talking about slippery slopes and the government coming to storm into your house and steal your guns. But again, the government simply cannot do that. And also, I would submit that everyone who is pro-guns would still recognize the need for regulations in some cases. Let me prove it to you. Um, if we allowed for a completely unfettered right to have guns anywhere, it would mean that we would have to allow people to carry guns on planes. Okay? What a terrifying idea that would be. Okay? So even if a good guy is trying to stop a bad guy on a plane with a gun, a bullet hole can shoot through the fuselage and lead to a loss of cabin pressure and suck people out of the airplane into the thin air, right? Could you imagine a more terrible way to go? Nobody wants that, nobody wants guns on planes. We don't have guns on planes, okay? Um, the second thing is that we don't have guns in the courtroom, okay? Why? Because this is a pretty tense place. What if you're a witness and you're testifying against someone who has victimized you in the past? or you're serving on a jury where you might give somebody a pretty stiff sentence. What if their family members who are non-mentally ill or non-criminal just happen to be packing heat in the crowd? Then maybe they can meet you out in the hallway during lunch, or they can meet you in the bathroom when you're not expecting it. That's probably a bad idea. In fact, we recognize this. There are not guns in courtrooms unless they're on the bailiff's hip 
and the very, uh, the, the very court that ruled D.C. versus Heller didn't allow any guns in the courtrooms. That's the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court didn't la allow any guns in the courtroom that day. Uh, so these are places that we have to limit our right. If we don't ensure that guns are kept out of courts, our constitutional due process rights would be violated. If we don't ensure that guns are kept out of planes, it limits our freedom of movement. What are we capturing here? The truth is that all rights like or gun rights, like all of our privileges, have to be balanced against other rights. That's crucial, and that's something that people in human rights, the field of human rights, really understand. So that brings us uh, to the next part, regulations. What regulations are actually reasonable or not too onerous? Well, I've uh, been talking about this for a long time with my students, and we've come up with four that we think are a pretty good idea. First, background checks on all sales. 85% of the public supports this. Currently, under the Brady Bill, you can't actually regulate all sales because gun shows and online sales are part of a loophole that allow people to sell without having to perform any background checks. That's clearly absurd, and we need to regulate that. The second thing is that we need to limit how many guns people can buy at one time. We uh, Currently, gun manufacturers are making a killing off of selling hundreds of guns to criminals at one time and then selling guns to people who are scared of those very criminals right, causing a feedback loop and making gun manufacturers tons of money. Uh, basically, their strategy is to create the illness and sell the cure. If we could limit the number of people that can buy guns or how much they can buy at one time, then we'll cut into some of these profits and cut into the number of guns that are on the street, which currently totals 350 million, roughly 1.05 per person in the United States. That's probably not the exact right statistic. Well, uh, get back to me on that. Um, third, we need to have gun registration, accident liability, and insurance. If in the human rights community, this is one of the lessons that we've learned over the years, if you want to stop something, if you want to regulate something, figure out how to make money on it. How do you make money on gun control? You sell insurance. Get the insurance companies involved and they'll be able to throw their weight against the gun lobby. That's a simple fact. Insurance lobbies are the only lobbies that are probably more powerful. So if we could establish liability laws that are relatively simple, relatively low insurance premiums for gun owners, and ensure that they're held liable if their guns are stolen and used in crimes, or used in accidents in the home, or used in domestic violence situations, that they're charged quite a bit of money, or they're, they're held civilly liable for those things, then eventually uh, we might be able to make money on the gun control side. Uh, finally, we need to have smart guns. These guns already exist. Gun manufacturers have patented guns that prevent non-owners from shooting them, so you actually have to have a fingerprint recognition. Uh, we should incentivize owners to have these guns, and we could work that into the insurance program. Simple enough. None of these stop people from having guns or hunting or doing anything like that. They just help us track and limit criminal and accidental use. Um, this rights with regulations ap approach should apply to everything. We should have rights with regulations in every part of our life. Currently, it's the way we approach driving. To drive, you have to have a license, insurance, and state registration. You also have to have safety mechanisms in your cars, like seat belts, and sometimes in places you have to have airbags. Um, to drink alcohol, you have to have a state ID, and the bartender is not allowed to overserve you at risk of contributing to an accident. I know that because I had to go through that uh, process. Uh, I was a bartender, uh, and I could overserve people and get in trouble for that. Uh, even for some neighborhoods, the right to own property is regulated by rules on how to keep your yard in order. You have to keep your yard a certain way, okay? Uh, why can't we re regulate gun transactions like we regulate driving, drinking booze, or cutting the grass, okay? I think that's completely reasonable that we could regulate it in the same way. Uh, the final thing that I want to say is that to convince people on the other side, if you're on the anti-gun side, Right, to convince people on the other side, you need to explain to them the notion of reciprocity. Rights always exist, or always should exist, with some notion of reciprocity, which is easy to explain. It's that old notion that my right to swing my fist ends where your face begins. Okay? It's no different with guns. My right to self-defense ends when I start to actually threaten you. Okay, so this is a huge problem. Uh, if we didn't recognize that there were some reciprocal relationships, even though we have rights, we'd swing our fists everywhere and we'd be pretty unpopular people in the bar, right? Uh, but we recognize this and people have long recognized this. 
Thomas, Jefferson's, uh, Thomas Jefferson and other founders uh, understood this. They knew that rights have to be paired with reciprocal thinking. You can't only consider your rights, but you have to consider the rights of others, and that's what means we live in a society together. Um, if, guns, uh, if gun rights and our rights to self-defense are exercised too widely, they start to erode our public spaces, and I think this is precisely what's happening today. Uh, so let me give you an example. First, we have stand your ground laws, which have been passed in these 20 states that are colored blue. Uh, these laws basically encourage people, encourage people to fight back against crime or perceived threats um, if it's necessary for their self-defense. Um, this also means that they can do what's called committing justifiable homicides. So it means that you're killing people and it's justified which it's never justified. From a human rights perspective, nobody ever gets to lose their right to life. That's the one right that's not regulated, right? You always have a right to life. Uh, but since stand your ground laws have passed in, two, uh, passed in 2005 in Florida, justifiable homicides have tripled, according to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. And other states, others of these blue states, have seen similar increases, according to the FBI. Uh, these Laws aren't applied equally to blacks and whites, which I hope is something we'll hear later on in the panel on race and gun violence. And they typically protect people who go out looking for trouble, like the man who shot Trayvon Martin. Uh, so we have to repeal these stand your ground laws. And we also need to work against open carry laws because skulking around with guns in public while proclaiming that you're protecting your right to self-defense encroaches on others' rights to self-defense. It violates notions of reciprocity. Um, so uh, just to give you an example, I actually don't know legally, and we have lawyers in the crowd that might be able to tell us, uh, at what point someone's open possession of a gun actually starts to violate my rights. Uh, is it when their finger's on the trigger while we're having a conversation, or is it when the gun's pointed at me without provocation? Uh, legally speaking, according to open carry laws, I have, absolute, I, have, I have no answers to this. I don't know when it starts to violate my right, and that freaks me out as a democratic citizen. So um, non-gun non carrying civilians are now asked to discern between someone asserting their gun rights and a potential mass shooter, okay? This is, a, this is something that we can't do, especially when the person with the gun is a stranger, okay? Uh, this is a worry that Thomas Jefferson and John Locke would have had because basically if everyone's carrying guns everywhere, it returns us to a state of nature. It takes us out of society. It removes us from the society that we trust in and that we've got a vested interest in trusting and giving up some of our rights so that we can live in a, in a natural order together. Uh, people in favor of these laws often say that we need them because the government can't protect us, but in a pinch, I call the cops. I don't call on a citizen's militia that I don't even know, uh, and I don't rely on my now unpracticed gun skills to protect myself. Uh, I call the government because we live in a democracy and that government is made in part by me. Right. The vigilante group around the corner looks just like the gang around the corner to me. None of them have a badge and none of them are part of my government. So instead of parading guns in public, uh, guns should be enjoyed in private spaces just like driving race cars in, in Louisiana or drinking in Louisiana are done. Right? They're done in private with our friends. Uh, finally, I just want to uh, show you a few examples of how I think this is making us uncivil and unfree in the United States, some of these open carry laws. Um, so in uh, th this year, when Allison Parker was shot live on TV in front of a camera, her boyfriend woke up the next day to read from conspiracy theorists who claimed that this event, which was captured on live television of this woman being shot to death, was actually made up by the government to justify coming to take our guns. They put this on his Facebook page the next day when he was starting the grieving process. They called this woman a crisis actor. This, if, if this doesn't show you that guns are making us indecent to one another, then nothing will. This is a terrible thing. Uh, another thing uh, is that an elected official in Arkansas threatened one of his constituents with a gun. So Senator uh, Jason Rappert was asked a question in a Lowe's parking lot, and he said, I don't want to answer your question. And then the, per the constituent uh, who voted for him actually persisted, and he said, not smart to come up and harass somebody in a parking lot who's carrying a handgun. Better be glad you decided to walk away. Hashtag armed and ready. What kind of society do we live in if our elected officials threaten us with guns? 
Not a very free one. Okay. Finally, and this is the one that makes me saddest because it's in the, the town I went to college in, Denton, Texas. Um, when Willie Hudspeth, the man on the left, who's a 69-year-old, uh, uh, brought these signs that say, please move this statue, which is of a Confederate soldier, to the Confederate Museum. Please move it to the Confederate Museum. And then it says, God loves everybody at the bottom. When he brought this sign and was protesting the Confederate soldier statue, which he's done for 20 years, I used to see him. He's a really nice guy. I drank coffee and hung out with him. When he was doing this, recently a 22-year-old came up with this AR-15 finger on the trigger and walked into this free speech situation asserting his right to have that gun because of open carry laws. And he was sent home by the cops but not charged with anything because he did not violate the law. This is crazy. This is somebody that's looking for trouble, going into a speech situation, asserting his right to self-defense, and he's a numbskull. He's a 22-year-old kid with his hat on backwards looking like an idiot, okay? <laughs> this is a problem. So in conclusion, I want to say we have an individual right to bear arms, but in what sense are we free if our fellow Americans refuse to express sympathy when we lose loved ones to gun violence? In what sense are we free if elected officials rebuke our attempts to speak to them with threats of homicide? And in what sense are we free if people can't protest racial discrimination publicly without the menace of assault rifles there to preemptively enforce others' rights to stand their ground? My answer is, and I think it's the only answer, is that we aren't that free. Our right to bear arms is exceptional, but with exceptional rights come exceptional responsibilities, and it's time to start exploring what those responsibilities actually are. Thank you. have 10 minutes to, to have a short conversation about some of the issues and one of the issues that is uh, near and dear to my heart besides ban the box is uh, the interaction of these laws with uh, veterans. I'm a big veterans advocate. Uh, now don't get me wrong, I was, uh, I was in the service for six years but I was one of the people that they kept as far away from guns as possible. I worked in uh, with satellites. I saw a gun once during basic training. They let me shoot it 36 times. Uh, to test and make sure I, could, I wouldn't shoot myself in the foot. Um, that's 36 rounds, not 36 times at, at, the, at the range. Um, so here's the issue. I absolutely agree that there's, that there's room for regulation, and uh, I'd like you to speak a little bit about that. And I absolutely believe that exposure to uh, gun violence can you know, uh, push people uh, towards acting that way. Uh, there's also a huge crisis in the veteran community where we have 22 veterans a day killing themselves. Okay, there's 22 veteran suicides a day. Obviously, many of them um, uh, uh, use guns to do that. The problem is, if we, uh, here's, so here's the issue, both theoretically, you know, how do you regulate without social stigma, and practically, how do you pass legislation in the U.S. when you have such a vocal demographic, because we all know that veterans show up at the polls, and veterans are very vocal about their rights. And uh, so, the worry is that if you, if you institute a system where those seeking mental health are then put on a list where they're no longer allowed to have guns, you're gonna have people either A, avoiding treatment, or B, rushing through treatment, uh, where they're, they're in a hurry to r remove that stigma by getting back to okay. Uh, and so you have a lot of negative effects on mental health. Currently in Louisiana, just you know, legally, one of the only ways besides you know, a restraining order where you've threatened someone before uh, to be taken, to have your gun rights taken away uh, is an interdiction proceeding, which is a very, very, very high hurdle. Um, we saw that uh, with Tom Benson. Um, that was the latest, most public interdiction hearing, and it's called a civil death in the law, so it's, it's practically impossible. And so even though uh, he made us lose Jimmy Graham to the Seahawks uh, <laughs> for refusing to give him a pay raise, even that was not enough to uh, get the court to say that he needed someone uh, to look after him. So the bar is so incredibly high uh, that if we lower the bar, we run the risk of you know, these folks getting on the list. So I'd like to hear uh, some suggestions about how we could address both issues. Should we take more questions or then? Uh, I, I was, I mean, it, it fell right oh, yeah, between, yeah. right between y'all's speeches, sure. so. Um, well, I can say I'm based purely on my own opinion um, is that uh, as a psychologist, uh, I think that it's important to lessen the stigma of mental illness. Uh, and although uh, mentally ill people do 
commit violent crimes, uh, most, you know, this is not, I, I think that it's a, it's a mistake, it's a, it's a bias to believe that people with mental illness are dangerous. Uh, most people diagnosed with mental illness do not pose a threat uh, to the people around them. Uh, so my personal stance would be uh, to focus less on restricting gun access amongst people with mental illness diagnoses. I think that people who have shown a prior history of violence you know, whether they're mental ill or not, uh, should have, you know, probably face stronger restrictions. But I think that guns should be restricted across the board. I think that it should be harder for anybody to get guns, uh, which makes it, which would lessen the, you know, reduce the, you know, access of weapons to people who could potentially act on them, um, but without increasing the stigma of targeting, you know, people who may, you know, uh, be struggling, but, you know, struggling successfully with things like bipolar disorder or depression. Thanks. My answer is short. Um, as long as we decide that we have a right to guns, uh, which we've decided, then we can't keep people that are mentally ill from having them. We can't keep accidents from happening. Uh, so that's why my proposals for regulation include basically uh, registering guns and insuring them against accidents and people using them for the wrong reasons. Okay, we've got time for two quick questions. Uh, on that track, but getting more close to home, uh, the South has been documented as being very high in violence, particularly gun violence, uh, particularly for police officers. Uh, Right now, in this state, we have had six police officers killed in the line of duty. It's different than dying in the line of duty, two different categories. We hold that first place distinction along with Texas, who have had six dying in the line of duty. We have about five million people in this state. Texas has 27 million. What makes us, this is just an awesome question, okay? the panels we have here. Why is Louisiana, or why would Louisiana be in the lead for this type of violence? Violence against police officers, which really strikes fear in the heart of the ordinary civilian, because if they're not afraid to kill the police, they're certainly less afraid to kill you. Uh, yeah, I'll start real quick. I think one of the problems that we have in Louisiana is we, we have a history of racialized violence and segregation, uh, which is one thing. So we have populations of people living in different places and the police are unfortunately tasked with uh, pol policing areas that are uh, poor minority and we're devoted to fighting the drug war in those places. So in Shreveport, basically uh, where I'm from, you have a couple of neighborhoods that drive all the gun violence and that's also the places that are driving uh, at least the illicit drug trade. Um, and we're asking police officers to uh, make money off of that war on drugs, which is a problem, uh, but also police those areas. In, uh, and they know that they have a lot of guns there. Uh, so police have to go in uh, in an impossible situation of stopping people from wanting to buy and sell drugs, which is not possible. That should be regulated just like everything else, rights with regulations. Uh, and they're also asked to fight against all these criminals that have guns uh, and, and fund them with the illicit drug trade. So it's an impossible situation. Uh, and to boot, uh, we don't pay cops enough in the United States. We don't pay police officers enough because we're devoted to always lowering taxes and electing people like Bobby Jindal who ruin the budget. So um, if you we're- you the state. Huh? You, said you said budget, you meant state. Yeah, the state budget. Yeah, the state, well maybe the national one too, but we could talk about that. Uh, so it's a, it's a confluence of problems, but I think drug war, right, taxes, uh, we have to have more public sector spending to solve these problems. Yeah. And what about just the limiting the type of gun? I mean, it, does that, can we look at that? Does that have any kind of like bearing against yeah. the Second Amendment? If we all had muskets, I think it would be a different world. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I believe what happened recently, uh, and, and if you at all hunt or enjoy guns at all, which I, I do, I don't hunt anymore, but I, I still enjoy going to the range. Um, there are certain calibers of, of ammunition that you still to this day can't, cannot find because, you know, uh, 
Obama's going to take your guns any day now. We're seven years into this thing, but you know, and so it's it's really slow. He's going for the long con, but uh, whenever you right. Well, and that's the thing. The slippery slope argument was used to uh, to combat any sort of limitation on ammunition sizes and those sort of things. Because as someone who grew up at that did hunt and and you know and and I'm comfortable around guns, I can tell you that um, you know you realize that they even make for normal Glocks that most policemen carry and a lot of people carry for concealed weapons. They actually make a Glock magazine that is this long. It sticks out the bottom of the gun. That's uh, I think it holds 50 or 100 rounds. All right. Now, if you brought that to the range around people who like guns, you would be laughed. You'd be laughed at, right? I mean, because it's, it's obviously stupid. But we've, we've gotten to the point where even saying, you know what, I don't think that a 100-round magazine is, is reasonable for a Glock. They also make one that actually has a, a, the spools on the side, like a... Like a and, and so we, we unfortunately reached the point where the, the conversation is being... Uh, run by uh, one particular lobby, and even common sense regulation faces a lot of these pro uh, You know, faces a lot of these roadblocks. And sorry. and can I can I add something to the first question that was asked about the sort of history of violence and the context of violence in Louisiana? What makes Louisiana different? Uh, this afternoon at, at the uh, two fifteen panel, we'll have a historian here who's going to talk about just that topic. He specializes in the history of violence in Louisiana, so. Be sure to come back to everybody else as well. And, and just one final thing I'll add to that, to, and then we'll, we'll probably have to wrap it up, is that I, I think that there, there's something, I don't know if this, if, if this is part of the conversation out there, and I don't know the, uh, I can't remember the facts of all the police shootings that have happened this year. Um, I do know that a lot of police shootings and a lot of police uh, deaths are caused in uh, the situations where it's sort of, you're never going to take me alive, copper, right? Okay, you're in situations where a lot of times the, the, the officer doesn't know that he's walking into a situation. Uh, I know that the trooper who was uh, from Iowa who was killed up in Shreveport uh, was arresting a guy who was a fugitive um, or, or had some sort of warrant, I believe. Or no, he, I'm sorry, he had just committed another crime, and so he wasn't going to be taken alive. The guy in Sunset, uh, you know, the, the, the man who killed the officer from Sunset, uh, was in another standoff situation. And so there's something to be said for the fact that uh, with current, uh, with the way we respond to crimes currently, uh, which we eventually, you know, it leads to uh, standoffs and eventually, you know, uh, tactical ins insertions by SWAT, um, you do end up in a lot of these tense situations where you either have, uh, you know, suicide by cop where a person is going to go out shooting, which leads to injuries, um, uh, or, uh, I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that you know the U.S. is the prison capital of the world, and we're the prison capital of the United States. So we're the prison capital, of the prison capital of the world. And a lot of people end up in situations where they realize, okay, I'm probably going to jail for the rest of my life because we have people in Angola who are serving life for marijuana. Okay, so I've just Good shot word. someone. Yeah. I'm going. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I'm not going to go to jail for the rest of my life. And that's how they choose to end their life and and those that, who are around it. So there's something to be said about managing the mindset of folks who uh, who have committed crimes that you know that there is no future that there's no there's no rehabilitation there's no way out of prison this is your last free moment and how are you going to do it and many of them choose to go out shooting uh, so that's just something to add to the conversation i really appreciate all of you guys listening and thanks a lot to the uh, to the panelists who spoke thanks for being here